Hi, I'm Yehuda Geberer. I'm a historian, Holocaust researcher, not only Holocaust, historian of Jewish history, researcher, tour guide in uh, Europe during normal times. And I'm um, here with you today, a special day, Yom HaShoah, a different type of Yom HaShoah uh, than we usually have um, because of, obviously, the coronavirus, and we're all doing this from home. But I want to speak a little bit about um, one angle of the story of the Holocaust, which is halachic questions that arose during the time of the Holocaust and how they were dealt with. And I, because of the circumstances, because we're in different type of uh, times today, um, I actually want to start with a short anecdote that just occurred a couple of days ago that might bring us into the whole topic of what is halacha in that time, during that period of time, during the Holocaust. Um, we, you know, obviously don't have shuls anymore, like everyone else, uh, most, of the, most of the Jewish world. No shuls, no minion, no davening together. But what we try to do in our building, like many other buildings, I, I imagine, is that we're an apartment building and everyone stands on their porch, and everyone's in their private home on their porch, no one's outside, no one's gathering together, so it's legal, it's kosher, and we try to have a minion that way. So... So we were doing this for quite a while, and one of my neighbors, who comes three times a day to the minion, he says to me, you know, you know, you know, uh, halachically, this is very problematic. I look at him, I don't know any halacha. I know history. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. He apparently knows halacha. And he tells me, this is very problematic. And according to many paiskim, what we're doing is not correct, and it's not a minion, and there's no, there's no real minion here. I look at him a little oddly because he's been coming three times a day to the Minyan. He obviously is participating. So what's going on? So I ask him, what's going on? So he says, look, once there is a Minyan, so I can be mitztarif, so I could participate, I answer amen, so I'm part of it. And you know what? Excuse me. Um, you know what? Uh, it's, I feel like there's a Minyan going on. I have nothing else. We have no shuls, we have no Minyan, we have nothing. Such a terrible time, such a challenging time. I need to be part of something. I need to be part of a mini. There's a mini going out on my porch. I'm going to go. I'm going to go participate. And that's what he feels and that's what he wants to do. And I think that story throws us right in to this whole topic of halacha in the Holocaust. Because the topic that we're talking about today, the title is Halachic Questions During the Holocaust. Now, the, the title is making an assumption. And the assumption is that there's something called halacha during the Holocaust. Now that's, that's an assumption that needs to be spoken out. What, what does that mean? Uh, now, the, 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 what does it mean, a halacha question? What does it mean, the, the term halacha during the I have a research colleague that's been researching the topic of halacha in the Holocaust recently, and he's come up with some incredible finds and has written about it. And he shared a lot of this stuff with me. And he, uh, and he explained, and he's, he's shown how new parameters of halacha are created because of the situation of the Holocaust. In other words, taking the halacha that always existed, and we're talking about it in a very orthodox, traditional way, and I'm talking about changing the halacha fundamentally. Um, that, but because of the situation, of the extreme situation that the Holocaust presents, so new frameworks, new parameters need to be created, and I want to illustrate that throughout this lecture. Um, I actually want to start with a story that's not in the center of the Holocaust, in Nazi-occupied Europe in some ghetto or camp, but actually on the other side of the world where there are refugees who ran away from the Holocaust, among them a wife's grandfather, who came from Poland, got a visa out, and made it to Shanghai, China, joins up with the Mir Yeshiva over there, famous story, everyone knows, the Mir Yeshiva, Shanghai, lots of refugees there, thousands of refugees, and he's there. And he described to me once what it meant to shake the Dalad Minim, shake Lulav and Esrig on Sukkot. It was a little variable, a little bit of a problem. There was no Esrig, they didn't have an Esrig. They found Lulavs, not hard to find. Hadassim, they found. Arav is very easy to find. They had those three. Esrig, nothing doing. After some point. I think at the beginning they were able to. A whole story, I'm not going to get into it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and they don't have. They sent people to look around. They found a Chinese fruit that was a citrus fruit, but it wasn't exactly an Esrig. The Rabbanim who were asked, they had some pretty prestigious rabbis 
in Shanghai, among the refugees and among the uh, local Jewish community. And um, they asked them, this is not an esrig. Sorry, there's no dollar minimum. You can't shake Lulu and esrig this year. I said to him, you didn't shake Lulu and esrig? Years. You were there for six years. No Lulu and esrig. So he said, look, some people said, no Lulu and esrig. Let's come in time. We can't shake Lulu and esrig this year. We're not going to be able to do it. What can we do? This is the situation we're in. We accept the situation we're in. Others said they took the three that they did have. Some even took the fourth, uh, um, this Chinese fruit that was not an esrig, and they held it together, and they said, Lezecher, to remember that there's a mitzvah of Dalad Aminim, of shaking Lulav and esrig. You don't get the mitzvah of Lulav and esrig for saying Lezecher and only having three out of the four. You know, the Torah and Halacha is pretty strict. It's either all or nothing. There's no compromises. The Torah is not that liberal. Oh, you don't have four, three is enough. It doesn't work that way. So what were they doing? What were they doing? Now, I don't know the Halacha. It could be that there are sources that talk about it and say it is good bidi evid and you should do that and it is good lezer. I have no idea. I don't know. My point is, is in a historical context. They're in an extreme situation and they have to create a new framework for what does the Halacha mandate how do they maintain, not just as a halachic mandate, but it, listen carefully to how I'm going to phrase it. How do they maintain a religious lifestyle, a spiritual experience, a religious identity? How do they maintain that during this challenging time? And that's what they're trying to do. It's not strictly a halachic issue. And I want to um, introduce the topic with a few Introductions. There are a few distinctions that we have to make before we understand the actual stories that took place. There's a difference between um, keeping mitzvahs under adverse conditions and asking halacha questions. It's just it's similar. There's many stories, and hopefully we all grew up with stories like that, about people who, with great dedication and great risk, very often kept the mitzvahs in ghettos and camps and all sorts of situations, and they were able to go ahead and do mitzvahs and, uh, and despite all the challenges and the, and the adverse situation. And then there's another idea that we're going to discuss, that we're going to focus on actually in this lecture, is that they attempted to, to they, they, not attempted, I'm sorry, they went and asked halachic questions to know what to do. When in doubt, they had a situation that they did not know how to proceed from a halachic point of view, and they went ahead and they tried to find out, they tried to ask, and they got answers. Sometimes the ones who they asked were themselves. Sometimes who they asked, the person they asked was the next guy over, because they didn't know. And then in some situations, they were able to approach competent halachic authorities, rabbis, rabbinical figures, poiskim, and ask them the question, what do we do in this situation? So those, that's, that's, that's one distinction. Another one that I want to, um, another dis- differentiation I want to make is between question, question, uh, questions that were asked in a ghetto setting to questions that were asked in a camp setting, concentration camp, labor camp. Or to a question that was asked in, in hiding, when people were in hiding. Those are three very different settings. A ghetto there's still families are still together. They're still in their own hometowns. Very rough situation there. Starvation, overcrowding, um, sickness. By the way, what type of sicknesses are in the ghettos? Very often epidemics, typhus, pandemics spreading around. To, you had that, right? Um, inside the ghettos, many people died in the ghettos of the conditions. But the ghetto is one type of situation. When they get to the camp, if they're one of the lucky ones that are not sent to the death camps where they're killed upon arrival, talking about people who are sent to concentration camps or labor camps, where they now live in barracks, three-tiered bunks, roll call every morning, separation between men and women, not really any children around, um, the situation there is different. The questions are going to be different. A person who's in hiding, hiding in some hole in the ground, in some... Um, righteous Gentile who's willing to take a risk to his life and hide him, and he has a halacha question, that's for sure a different situation. So we have to eat, understand where and what is the context of the question. Another distinction I want to make is the result of time and place. A question that's asked in 1940 is different than a question that's asked in 1944. 
The situation is different. They've already gone through much of the Holocaust. They've already suffered. Their physical condition might be different. They know, they're aware of different things that are going on around them already. Um, and of course, the difference in place. Uh, a question asked in Western Europe is different, is different than a question that's asked in Eastern Europe. Even within a place like Eastern Europe, a question that's asked in Poland is different than a question that's asked in the Soviet Union. Even within a place like Poland, but a question that's asked in one type of ghetto would be different than a question asked in another type of ghetto. So we always have to be careful in understanding when and where the question is being asked to understand that concept, context. Excuse me. Um, the last distinction that we want to have in mind before we actually try to get into the topic itself is between regular halachic questions, normal, normative questions that are asked as part of a regular religious Jewish life, you know, kashrus, uh, Shabbos, question of like um, what might be asked about, uh, about kosher food in the ghetto. Can be, there's questions of kosher food in the ghetto. That would be one field of questions. And then there would be a, another type of question that's a, it's a, I'm sorry, the first category of questions is unique because it's a question that's asked in the Holocaust, meaning it's a normal Jewish halacha question that's asked in the context of the Holocaust. However, the second category is a Holocaust question. It's a Shoah question. A question about, you know, we're going to see later a few more examples of a question of, of risking lives for one reason or another. We're going to mention later on Ritzvi Hirsch Meislish, a Hungarian Rav, the Weizner Rav, who was in Auschwitz. And at one point he was asked by a a father, he said his son was taken, and he's on a wagon. They were counted, the amount of victims who were going to be taken away, they were taken to be killed. And he can bribe the guard standing by the wagon within the next few minutes and get his son off. But since they're going to be counting the amount of people on that wagon, so then he knows for sure that someone else will be taken in his place. Can he take his son? Or not? Oh, again, the Weizenrov is in Weizen in his study by a desk with a sforum. No. The Weizenrov is a prisoner in Auschwitz, just like this other guy, wearing the same stripes with the same number on the arm. He says to the guy, I can't answer your question. We're, we're in Auschwitz. I need the Yishuv Hadas. I need to be settled. I need to be able to think about it. I need to be able to look up Sfarim. I might need to ask advice from... You're asking a question of life and death. How do you expect me to answer it? I'm not the Weizenerov in Auschwitz. I'm a prisoner. You can't ask me that. I, I'm not equipped to deal with a question like that. The guy says, Rabbi, I have no one else to turn to. Please answer my question. And he says, I can't. I... I, I it's a life and death question. I need to have some sort of normalcy to, to, you know, and of course he's starving also. He's just not in a condition that he can answer his question. So the guy says to him, Rabbi, I understand from your hesitation that it's not permitted, that I'm not allowed to do it. So I'm going to have to let my son go. The Weizen Rav says, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. He says, so then I understand that it is permitted. So he says, no, I didn't say that either. I didn't say that. And he refuses to answer the question. The guy comes to the rabbi the next day. And he says, Rabbi, you didn't give me an answer. So I decided on my own. I did not rescue my son. I did not want to be responsible for someone else's death. That's a halachic question, but that's not a halachic question that's asked ever in any normal situation. That's a holocaust Halacha question. So we're going to try to talk a little bit about both. Um, it's important to understand the mindset of the questioner and to the questionee, the one who's being asked the question to, um, to go into their mindset, to understand them, um, to, you know, they're dealing with a question like I described in the last story, in real time, in a tough situation, with the information that they have. They don't have all the information that we have in hindsight. They don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what the Nazis are planning. They do deal with it the best that they can in the situation that they're in. Um, so it's important to understand that. And, and, uh, and, uh, and having said that, I want to say a story that happened with me. 
I was giving a lecture on this topic, a very similar lecture on halacha questions in, in the Holocaust to a younger group, to a group of, I think they were high school children. And I described a story, a question that Rabbi Ephraim Ashri, who's quite famous when we talk about halacha questions in the Holocaust, he always came, comes up because Rabbi Ephraim Ashri was a rav in the Kovna ghetto who um, dealt with these type of questions. He's the only rabbi, a halachic uh, paisik, who survived the Kovna Ghetto, and he, from memory he wrote four volumes of responsa, Shailas Uchuvis Mi Mamakim, uh, of questions that he received during the years in the Kovna Ghetto, during the Holocaust. And he, one of the questions that he uh, describes is, I presented to the class, to this, this group of boys then, and I said that there was an Aktia in the Kovna Ghetto. Aktia means that the Nazis are sweeping through the ghetto, they did this from time to time, you know, the final solution was to wipe out the Jews, it wasn't just to keep them in the ghettos or in camps, it was to exterminate the Jewish people. And they rounded up the, the Jewish population in the ghettos. They, in, the, in the case of, Ka, of Kovna, they put them on trucks. They drove them outside of the city. We do, it, we do the drive when I go with groups in Kovna. We go from Kovna, where the area of where the ghetto was, to the Ninth Fort, where the Nazis took them. And in a field by the Ninth Fort, they had them lined up, mowed down with machine guns, and shot. They didn't have gas chambers in the area of Lithuania. It was part of the Soviet Union. They were shot in what's called Kivrei Achim, mass graves. And, um, and that's what happened to the Jews of Kovna. So what happens when there's an Aktsia? Many Jews try to go into hiding. So the question came to Rav Ephraim Ashri that there was a hiding place that they had prepared that there was 25 Jews, full families, but 25 people hiding. They were going to, go, they were going to be hiding there. One of the families had a baby. Now, these hiding places are small, they're cramped, they're airless, there's no food. And babies very often cry in that situation especially. Now if they cry, if the baby cries, the Nazis who are going around looking for Jews are going to hear the cry. They're going to come and find the hiding place. So the people inside the hiding place, this bunker, are going to try to get the baby quiet. They're going to do everything they can to get the baby quiet. And then they're going to do everything they can until the baby's going to be quiet forever. They're going to quiet down the baby so that 25 people don't get caught and get sent to their deaths. The question they're asking Rav Ashri is, is it permitted to take an extreme measure like that? I'm talking about the parents themselves. To quiet the baby, that the baby will be quiet forever. To put a pillow on the baby's mouth and make sure that the baby will never make again another sound. Is that permitted or not? <sighs> For a rabbi to get a question like that, now, no rabbi in history probably ever got a question like that. None of his training or his smicha that he got ever trained him to get a question, to, what to do with a question like that. But he goes ahead and answers it because it's a question that he received. And that's something we, need, we can't take for granted, that people continue to ask questions. We assume that it's obvious. The title of the lecture said, Halacha questions during the Holocaust. So if they're halacha questions, it must be the people are asking them. Well, let's stop for a second and say, hey, why in the world were they asking that? Why were they asking questions? Their lives fell apart. Nothing else is normal in their life. They don't go to work every day. The kids don't go to school. Why are they still asking questions to the rabbi? And let's think about the rabbi. The rabbi is probably not getting paid. He doesn't have a community anymore. There's no communal life. There's nothing. Their, their, their lives are controlled by other people now, by the Nazis, who are destroying them. What, what type of life is that? Why is there any dialogue of halachic discussion? Why does that even exist? That's something. That's something also to point out and remember. And it's something to, to take away, take away from this whole story, is that people continue to ask questions and rabbis were willing to answer them. And to take that responsibility, a communal responsibility to their followers who looked up to them and expected that from them, and they delivered the goods. So Rabbi Ashri was one of those rabbis. And he says, not only is it permitted to quiet down the child, but it is required to quiet down the child, obviously to do anything possible to quiet them down in a normal way, but if it's unfortunately not possible, then you have to quiet down the child forever. Now, did they do it or not? That's irrelevant, meaning that's not, that's not part of the story. Did they do it? Were the parents able to do it? Did the child even cry? We don't know, right? I mean, that's irrelevant. That's not part of the story. The question is, in the halachic parameters that are created, 
And Rav Ephraim Ashri gives a bunch of reasons. One of the reasons were, he says the child is a raidef. The child is crying, the baby is crying, and he's calling out, as it were, obviously I mean, it's a baby, he's not, he's not doing this on purpose, right? But he's calling to the Nazis to come and kill 25 Jews. That's essentially what the baby is doing with its crying. So then the child, the baby's a raidef. And a raidef has to be killed. So go ahead, it has to be done. If it has to be done, it has to be done. So I'm going and trying to explain this to the class. And a boy raises his hand. I say, please, yes, what do you, what do you have to ask? And he says, I, I don't accept this. Is, I don't, this is impossible. No, no, this can't happen. I don't understand. I said, what's wrong? He said, what type of cruel parent and cruel rabbi? What are we talking about here? What type of parent would do that to a child? What, what are we talking about? No way. If I was there, I would never do such a thing. What type of parent does that? And I said, first of all, I don't know if they did it. And like I said, it's irrelevant to the story. But the second thing you said about if you were there, you have no idea. You don't know what it was going on like, like is there. You're talking about a very tough situation. The moral dilemmas here are impossible to deal with. There's something that if, you know, we can't even imagine being faced with, and they bring morals to a new extreme and also to new definitions of what morals are in many, many situations, not just in this situation. What are morals, and how do these dilemmas get solved, and is there any way to solve them? Perhaps there's no answer, right? And a, as a moral dilemma. Rabbi Ashri is addressing it as a halachic question and giving it a halachic framework. Whether they did it or not is already a different story. And he's giving it those parameters. And that's what's going on here. So we, we, um, we're going to examine a few of these questions. We have to keep in mind that um, many times the questions were never asked to a rabbi. To, in the traditional sense of coming to ask the rabbi questions, like you come with a chicken in, in the shtetl to show the rabbi is it treif or not. That's not usually how it went. Very often what was happening was is the person was being his own paisik. He had a halachic question, he had no one to ask, and they decided for themselves. They gave the halachic framework themselves. We hear that in many testimonies. Very often women who were faced with his, you know, I found, you know, my, my, my colleague who I mentioned earlier, he's found this in many uh, testimonies of survivors about how they made these decisions with halachic considerations, not based on their gut feeling. They understood that this should be the right thing to do, and this is the right thing to do in this situation. Whether they were right or not is irrelevant. That's not the point. The point is the halachic process. Um, very often it would be asking their neighbor, someone nearby. You know, the availability of rabbis is not always so simple during those times. But there are stories of very unique rabbis who were there to answer the questions. Now, most of these rabbis we don't even know about. Most of them didn't survive. Uh, even many who survived, they didn't write down what the questions were. So there might be thousands of such rabbis. We don't know of most of them. So we try to take of the few that we do know and try to extrapolate from that about what was, this, what was similar situations. So I'm going to mention three somewhat famous figures, rabbinical figures, who dealt with these questions. The common denominator of all three is that they all three survived. Excuse me. And all three of them wrote down following the war, what the questions they wrote from memory, what the questions that they received were, to be able to learn from it, to be able to let it tell its story. And what's the great thing about it is that these three figures were from different parts of Europe. So it really brings different angles, different perspectives. Uh, Rabbi Fry Mashri, I mentioned earlier, he was a Kovna ghetto, Litvak, in Lithuania, which was under the control of the Soviet Union at the beginning of the war. The Nazis only invaded in 1941. It's a different story in the Kovna ghetto in Lithuania. In Lita, as we say, I mentioned earlier of Tzvi Hirsch Meislish, who was the Weizner of. Weizen was a town outside of Budapest in Hungary. So it's the story of Hungarian Jewry. Southern, further south, the Nazi invasion comes at a much later stage. He's sent to Auschwitz like most Hungarian Jews in the summer of 1944. A whole different perspective. He's a Hasidic Rav. And then in the middle, we have Rabbi Shua Moshe Aronson, also pretty famous figure. Um, Shu Moshe Aronson was a Sachachabra Chassid. He lived in central Poland, in the heart of Polish Jewry. He was a Rav in Sanek. 
He was in Warsaw during the war. The Warsaw got up for a short period of time. He was in the Kunin labor camp. He was later in Auschwitz. He was in Buchenwald. He survived, moved to Israel. He was a Rav in Petach Tikva. Rutsir Smeislish that I mentioned survived and moved to Chicago. He was a Rav there. And Ephraim Ashri that I mentioned survived and moved to New York where he was the rabbi of the Beis Medrash Haggadol on Norfolk Street on the Lower East Side, Manhattan. Until a few years ago, he passed away at a very old age. So I want to give a couple of examples of each, of questions that they each received. Rabbi Shum Moshe Aronson, he, and again, similar to today, he receives a question in the Warsaw Ghetto, in the early years of the war. And it's important to understand this is the early years of the war, the early years of the ghetto, this is before, way before the final solution. There's no axias, there's no deportations to Treblinka, to the gas chambers. It's before that. It's even before the later stages of the ghetto, where the starvation and the disease and the death toll in the ghetto was so rampant that it changed the whole situation of the ghetto. It's relatively, the conditions are very harsh already, overcrowding, there already is starvation, there already is all those things, but it's still the early stages of the ghetto. And he's asked, the question arises in the ghetto, should rabbis encourage or go against or ban weddings, Jewish weddings, from getting, people from getting married? There were those rabbis who said, definitely we should encourage it. We're gonna, in these times, we need people to build their life together. We need a source of happiness. We need to bring more children into the world. There should be a continuity to the Jewish people. The Jewish people are going to live forever. It's a statement to be made. And we should encourage marriage and weddings. Moshe Shur Moshe Aronson was one of those who were opposed to it. And he said that we should ban weddings. We should not allow it at all. He gives a whole list of reasons. I want to focus in on one reason, a little bit irrelevant. Today we also talk about weddings. Should we have weddings? Again, it's not the exact same situation. I'm not comparing anything to the Holocaust. It's very hard to compare anything to the Holocaust. The situation, any situation in the Holocaust is incomparable. The harshness of realities of life, the death, the Nazis, the... Anyone who tries to make these, I would call them foolish comparisons, it's, you have to be very careful. But in a very general sense, there is something similar here. When we talk about, are we allowed to have weddings? Do we make weddings? Not allowed to make weddings? How many people? Ten people? No people? You know, it's a discussion today. And one of the reasons that Rishul Maish Aronson gives not to have the wedding is because the mikvahs have been closed in the Warsaw Ghetto. Mikvahs were closed. Mikvahs were closed also the discussion of today. Men's mikvahs, the women's mikvahs. He says the women's mikvahs, all the mikvahs were closed, and the Nazis closed all the mikvahs. So the, the, they can't go to the mikvah. There's no mikvah, there's no taras and mishpacha. How could they have married life? It's not going to be a kosher married life. There's no kedusha. There's no base bias of Yisrael. There's no Yiddish ishtub, he would say in Polish Yiddish. There's no Jewish home without Tarz and Mishpach, without the mikvah. So how can you have encouraged people to get married? You're knowingly putting them in a situation where they won't be able to sustain it in a kosher and halachically appropriate way. So, so, that, so he said, no, no more marriages because of that. W- one of the reasons. Um, Ephraim Ashri was asked about whether they should have a mezuzah. They should place a mezuzah on the door at the entrance of the, of the ghetto. Should they have a mezuzah or not? Now, uh, so the, let's think about the question. We know that a mezuzah, if it's a diras kva, if it's a permanent dwelling, then it's required to have a mezuzah. A diras arai, if it's a temporary dwelling, no mezuzah. So if he says, yes, mezuzah, what's he saying? Your home in the ghetto is long term. Long term, oy vey. Long term, we're here for, for a long time. It's a diras kva, we have to put up a mezuzah. If it's a diras arai, he's saying, it's a diras arai. We're going to get out of this soon. Don't worry. He's making a statement about the stability of their situation in the ghetto. Uh, if, 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 if he, but on the other hand, we could look at it just the opposite. We don't know what they were feeling when they got the answer. We could say that if he says diras kva, he's saying, we're going to survive every aktsia. We're never going to be sent to be killed. We're going to live here till the end of the war. Don't worry about it. It's a diras kva. Put up those mezuzahs. If he says, Diras Arai no mezuzah, then what's he saying? And then he's saying, the next aktsia, we're all going to be taken away, we're all going to be killed. So they can lose hope. So the halacha question is really making a statement about what the rabbi and his questioners are feeling about their stability in the ghetto situation. It's interesting, 
he was asked the question. We know that Yom HaShoah was made during the time of the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion, the revolt, the Warsaw Ghetto fighters, the Mered Ghetto Varsha. And that's one of the reasons we're commemorating. That's why it's called Yom HaShoah Vehagvura in the 1950s when they originally made it. Because during these days was the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. We focused so much on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we forgot that there were fighters in many of the ghettos. And in Kovna Ghetto, there was also fighters. And these fighters, they didn't revolt in the ghetto. They organized themselves, and then they escaped from the ghetto as a unit, and they went to the forests outside Kovna, and they fought the Nazis as partisans. Okay. The question came to Rabbi Ephraim Ashri, this rabbi who learned in the Telz Yeshiva and the Slabotki Yeshiva was close with the Dvar of Rome, the Rav Rom Dev Ber Kahana Shapiro, the last chief rabbi of Kovna who died in the ghetto. And they ask him, they ask him, should we support these fighters, give them food, help them get weapons, help them smuggle themselves out of the ghetto, provide them with whatever they need? Should we be ambivalent or should we stop them? What are, what are all this? So why is this a halacha question that the rabbi has to decide? First of all, you know, they asked a lot of people. They asked the, the Yudenrad also, the ghetto. And, but they were asking, it's a pikuach nefesh, it's sakana. The Nazis believed in collective punishment. If they caught someone doing a crime, they punished other people for his crime. That's the way the Nazis prevented people from doing the wrong thing very often. They would take random people, or that person's family, or his neighbors, and punish them. Punished by the Nazis usually is harsh punishment, shooting them, killing them. And if they would catch a partisan, say, partisan, he came from the Kovna ghetto. Every partisan that we catch from the Kovna ghetto, we're going to kill a certain amount of people in the Kovna ghetto because they obviously have been helping him. They helped him get out, they helped him with weapons, they helped him with medical treatment, they helped him with whatever. So the residents of the ghetto are going to get punished. So he's, these people are putting others at risk. So maybe we shouldn't help them. We could either be opposed to it, we should try to stop them, or we should be ambivalent. Or maybe we should say, if these people get out, then some Jews from Kovna will survive. If everyone stays inside, there's not going to be a single Jew left from Kovna. Everyone's going to be killed. So maybe in order to ensure that some people survive, we should try to help them get out. You know what his answer was? Do anything you can to help the fighters. Because the fighters in the forest might stay alive till the end, and we want to ensure at least the survival of a few. Anything you can do to help the fighters, go and help them. A psak from a Befrayim, a Shri, and the residents of the ghetto followed that psak, and they helped the Kovna ghetto fighters. Rabbi Tzir Shmaizlish, um, he was in Auschwitz, and he gets there in the summer of 1944, and, and he was able to smuggle in a shaifer together with him small shaifer. There was a group of young Jewish boys who were going to be killed. They were going to set, out, set to go to the gas chambers. And, um, and they, the Nazis, the summer of 1944, when Hungarian Jewry was brought to Auschwitz, they were brought in such large droves that the Nazis simply didn't have enough room in the gas chambers to, to kill them all. And they sometimes had to wait, like, on, you know, like waiting to be killed. A terrible situation. In specific... Uh, barracks near the gas chambers and these young boys were going to be killed in the gas chambers and they sent a message to Svirish Meislish they heard he has a shaifer they want to hear the shaifer come blow the shaifer for us that's putting a lot of lives at risk if he would go ahead and do that it's putting his own anyone who's around him nearby the boys themselves who are going to be killed but I can't be the one responsible for their death because of me because of blowing the shaifer so he writes in the Shailah Suchuvah's Mekad She Hashem, that's the name that he gives to the Sefer that he writes after the war, he writes the whole halachic back and forth that he has with himself. Should I blow for them? Should I not blow for them? And he comes to the Maskana. And he says, it's incorrect. It's not appropriate. It's incorrect. It's probably forbidden. I should not be blowing the Shaifer for them. Pikuach Nefesh, it's a Sakana. It's endangering people's lives. Don't do it. And he said, but you know something? They want to hear the Shaifer. These Jewish children are going to be killed. And they're going to be going to their deaths the day after Rosh Hashanah, or on Rosh Hashanah. And they're young. How much of Yiddishkeit did they experience? They should hear the sound of the shaifer. They should 
make Hashem the king on Rosh Hashanah by hearing the Shaifer. They should have some religious experience, a spiritual uplift. They're begging for it. They want it. I should give it to them. I should give them that Jewish identity. They should go to their deaths as proud Jews. And he says, I decided based on my second line of reasoning. And then he writes something that you'd think you'd never hear from a Hungarian Orthodox Hasidic rabbi. He says, and I did it even though there is no source in that in halachic literature. There is no ein shum mekor bahalacha. There's no mekor for this. There's no source for this. In other words, I did something that seemingly was against halacha. Because the situation called for a new, there's a new framework for halacha. In Auschwitz, when children are going to be killed in the gas chambers, there's a new halacha. The Sif in Shulchan Aruch that says, blow Shaifer on Rosh Hashanah, doesn't apply here, because the Shulchan Aruch also says, don't endanger lives. But there's a new Shulchan Aruch for Auschwitz. And the Auschwitz Shulchan Aruch says, blow it for them. Give them that sense of identity. I want to end off with a story back in the Warsaw Ghetto. Helena Birnbaum, who's a survivor who's still alive, she relates the story, I heard her testimony, and she said that her mother was able to get horse meat in the ghetto once. Horse meat is not kosher. And the mother decided to cook up the horse meat and give it to the children to eat. They shouldn't starve. They were starving. They just sometimes went days at a time without food in the Warsaw Ghetto. Keep in mind that close to 100,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto died from the conditions of the ghetto before the deportations to Treblinka to the gas chambers began, just from the physical conditions of the ghetto. So we, don't want, to, we want to prevent starvation. Pikuach Nefesh, we're feeding the children. Her father, and he said, she says that her father was, wasn't just traditional in the ghetto, he, was, he became even more religious, he was very strong in his religion, and his religious life, and he said, I'm not eating it. I can't eat it, I can't eat it, I can't bring myself to eat horse meat. So they ate it, and her father didn't. Now let's think about it. They did not ask a rabbi the question. These people are also, it sounds like from the story, the way she said it, they're simple Jews. I don't think they, they opened the Shulchan Aruch and looked through the Shach and the Taz to answer the question either. They did it based on their understanding of what kashras is, what halacha is, and what is, who am I as a Jew, and what does my identity mean as a Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto? As a traditional Jew, as a Jew who strives to keep the halacha. The mother says, my children, my children's lives, I need to keep them alive. Kashras does not apply here. I need to keep my children alive. I can't watch them die. Pikuach nefesh. The father doesn't even address what the children should do or not. The father, what does he say? I can't bring myself to eat it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't eat it. Is he making a psak? Is he making the right psak? Is there a right psak? He's saying something. He's saying, my life is out of control. Everything was taken from me. I need a continuity. I need a consistency. I need something, a framework, a, a something that gives me a certain parameter of life, meaning to my existence, relationship with God, a religious experience, a spiritual lift, whatever you want to call it, whatever, whatever language speaks to you. It's giving it a certain sense of meaning that he decides for himself that in this context, in this framework, this is what I need to do. This is what I should be doing. For us today, you know, this was a mechanism of, of coping, a coping mechanism. This was a method of continuity, of identity, of fortitude, of strength, of inspiration, and of hope. And for us today, who... You know, even with the corona, we're not anything, anything close to that situation. But it's a message that can really resonate and say, not just in my commitment to a halachic lifestyle. That's on a superficial level. It's really what stands behind it. It's my commitment to a spiritual life, to a certain identity, to take an inspiration and a meaning of what that identity means and recognize that I'm part of that Jewish destiny and story. Thank you very much.